All right, so I'm Chandler Carruth. Um, I work at Google. I work on C++ at Google. I work on LLVM at Google. Um, recently, I've been, can we take the mic down just a touch? Um, you know, recently been working on lots of LLVM, uh, and I started working on kind of redesigning parts of the LLVM pass manager. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm a little bit quiet and hard to hear today. Turns out this time slot is in fact cursed. Um, I started losing my voice at about 8 o'clock last night. I'm going to try and make it all the way through, though. All right. So this is actually part two of a kind of two-part talk. Um, I actually intended to give this talk in April at EuroLVM. I wanted to tell people about some of the work I've been doing on the Pass Manager. And I realized that we really needed to kind of go over the background for how the Pass Manager, how passes in LLVM are even designed, how we think about them, what the kind of basic components are. And so I ended up talking a lot about that instead. But I still really want to talk to you guys about the, the new design that I've been working on for the Pass Manager. Um, I think it solves a lot of the problems that we have today. I think it's pretty promising going forward. Um, and so I'm going to t spend most of this talk actually talking about the core of the new Pass Manager design. It's going to be very low level. It's going to have tons of code up on the slide decks. Hopefully that works for you guys. Um, I can't point at the code, but I've tried to highlight the pieces of the code that I really want you guys to look at. And we're going to kind of step through each of the parts of the code. One of the big complaints about the previous Pass Manager is that almost no one understood how it worked. Like, how many people here feel like they really have a good handle on how the old Pass Manager works? Yeah, OK, sure. Sure, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there will be a quiz if you actually want to, to step up to this. But it's, it's really confusing. And so my goal is that by the end of this talk, at least that isn't true for the new design. And you guys can let me know how I do. OK, so from the previous talk, you don't need to have all of the background of the previous talk. Uh, but from it, there, there's a couple of key things, right? A pass in LLVM's kind of world is something which operates on some unit of IR. Um, units kind of fuzzily defined. You could have a function. You could have a module. Um, there are all kinds of ways we can think about how to break up the IR. But you've got some chunk of it. You're going to kind of transform it from one thing into another thing probably equivalent for some definition of equivalence, right? Um, an alternative use of pass in LLVM is to try and analyze that chunk of IR and derive some kind of higher order information, right? Some higher level information about exactly what that IR does. So, so I started from just these kind of very basic ideas about what a pass looks like. And I tried to see if we could actually design the pass management layer around this kind of simplistic view and still have it solve all of the needs. And uh, you know, like, what if we could actually just let the code model this very basic idea? Maybe it won't work, but it might give us a better starting point. And so I started off with this idea of a pass. Super, super simple, right? Like, you have a class. It has a constructor. The constructor sets things up. It has a run method. The run method accepts some unit of IR, in this case, a function, right? And it does something to that function. Couldn't get much simpler than this. But the question is, how close to this could we keep everything and actually address the use cases we have for the pass manager? Well, let's, let's just start kind of experimenting. And this is actually almost literally what a pass looked like on the first iteration of the new pass manager when I first checked it. And if you go back through the commit history, you'll actually find a test case that looks almost exactly like this code. Right? And so we're like, OK, well, then if that's the simplest idea of a pass, what, what does the simplest idea of a pass manager look like? How do we actually kind of you know, take that down to its core principles? Well, it, it does aggregation. That's the core idea of a pass manager is it takes a bunch of other passes, aggregates them together into some sequence, right? runs the, the whole sequence over a particular unit of IR. One of the key ideas of a pass manager is that a pass manager is itself a pass. Right? And so you can see down here, this is a class. And it has a run method, which accepts a unit of IR. Right? So it satisfies our, our definition of a pass. But it also has this like really fancy, clever template metaprogramming, blah, 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 that you guys probably think is ridiculous up at the top, that's actually taking care of aggregating passes. All right? And so I, I think we at least need to understand how all of this works. Because there's no virtual, there's no like type hierarchy at all here. And, and this, is, this is a bit of clever programming. 
And I can take no credit for this clever programming. The entire idea came from Sean Parent. I, there, there are all kinds of links in the actual code if you want to read more about it. But I'm going to give you the, the like, you know, super, super fast version. So what is this whole concept model thing? All right. The idea of a concept is that it is this kind of totally abstract virtual interface, right? We have a virtual destructor, we have a virtual run method, right? We actually take the unit of IR as a template parameter, right? This, this is this great kind of distillation of what a pass is. And around this, we can build any pass we want. And then we have a model of this particular, you know, kind of high level concept, which is a class template, right? It derives from that and it overrides that run method, and it delegates that run method to some concrete type. Right? It's just a wrapper, but it's a wrapper that hides a particular interface inside of a virtual interface, and it does it for us, so that our pass doesn't have to understand virtual, doesn't have to have a type hierarchy, doesn't have to deal with any of that business. All of this is completely hidden. No one has to deal with that. Right? All you have to do is you have a class. If it has a run method, it is a pass. You can, you can add it to a pass manager. Does that make some vague sense to people? I don't want to belabor this too much. All right. So if we have a pass manager, right, and we can add random passes to it, the next thing we need is we need the ability to kind of you know, move between layers of the IR. Right? We need some way of adapting between different layers of the IR. The simplest idea I could come up with for this so we have some kind of, and, and yes, these names are hilarious, module to function pass adapter. Um, I'm sorry if anyone here gets kind of like Java throwbacks, but we have a module to function pass adapter, and it, accept, it you know, wraps a function pass, and it is a module pass, right? And it does the kind of obvious thing. It takes the module, and it finds every function in the module, and it runs the function pass on each function in the module. There's nothing fancy here, right? Like the entire code for this is actually on the screen. Right? With this, we're done. So, good keynote? <laughs> okay, so it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? But like, this is actually the simplest baseline we could get for kind of pass management. But now we need it to actually work. We need it to actually serve the needs that LVM has, which are much more complicated. And primarily, that has to do with analyses. Everything would be very simple if all we did was transform IR. Unfortunately, this, this whole idea of analyzing the IR is really, really complicated. All the complexity comes from here. So an analysis pass is, you know, in theory, just a special kind of pass. All right? But it has a lot of very special properties that mean we want to treat it totally differently from a lot of other passes. Okay? The, the, the kind of really, really important aspects of an analysis pass, it's got an immutable view of the IR, right? It's never mutating the IR. It produces a result, okay? It doesn't just transform the IR, it can't. The IR is immutable to an analysis. It produces some result, and that result can be queried. And the result may actually be the logic of the analysis. In many cases, we don't actually compute anything. What we do is we just give you a result that will lazily compute what you need when you need it. All right, Elvium really likes to be lazy. I'm a big fan of this. So that's, that's kind of the core attributes of an analysis pass. And I want to look at it a concrete example because with analysis passes, if I give you these like, you know, theoretical examples, it's just going to be boring. So we're going to look at a concrete example. Turns out that this is pretty easy. Here's the dominator tree. Now, I've deleted a bunch of comments and I've deleted a bunch of other stuff, but this is actually the core of the dominator tree. And what you might notice here is that the dominator tree doesn't have a single thing to do with the pass in it. There is nothing going on here about a pass. All right? And dominator trees aren't passes. Dominator trees are the result of running an analysis pass. Right? They're actually the result. The analysis pass looks something like this. Okay? You have a dominator tree result. Right? And we need a little bit more machinery to define an analysis pass in the new infrastructure. The first piece of machinery is that we need some way to identify analysis passes. Because we're going to want to run them automatically, we're going to want to manage dependencies between them. We do a lot of things with analysis passes that we just don't do with transformation passes. And in order to do that, we need to have some good way of identifying them. And we do that with this kind of abstract ID that returns a void star that's unique to the pass. Uh, this is pretty much the same trick that the current pass manager uses and that piles of other parts of LVM use. Nothing too crazy. The rest of it, though, looks a lot more like 
the passes that I've been showing you, right? There's a constructor, it sets things up. Turns out this one's really easy to set up, right? There's a run function, it runs over some IR. I've even got a bug in my slide that's supposed to be a const function, but you know, that's fine. Right? And it computes a result and it returns it. Nothing, nothing crazy here. All of the fun stuff is actually in the result. And this tends to be a pretty common pattern in LLVM. The actual analysis passes are, are relatively uninteresting. Most of the interesting parts are the result. But it's a pretty nice way to kind of think about how you take a piece of IR and you get this result that tells you something at a very high level about that IR. Vaguely happy with this so far? Totally happy to have questions. Everyone's super quiet. It's early. All right. So the hard part of this then, like you know, we have results already. The analysis pass itself is super, super simple. The hard part is, well, when do we run the analysis pass? This is actually what is the question, OK? So historically, we had a very strange approach to this in my mind. We actually tried to solve this as a scheduling problem. Now, you may know from, from your computer science classes that scheduling problems are hard. In fact, they have like special classifications of how hard they can be. And it turns out that LVM scheduling problem is no different. If you actually go and you profile um, a debug build and you run all the regression tests and you profile the regression tests, you will find that about like 10% of the entire time of the regression test suite is spent scheduling analysis passes, which blows my mind. Okay, we're spending all of our time figuring out in which order to run the analysis passes to satisfy their dependencies. It's really, really, really wasteful and it's completely unnecessary because we can, we can use much simpler ways to do this by caching. So I want to think of the entire thing as a caching problem. We're way better at solving that. It's super easy to think about and it also opens the door to doing lots of more interesting things about picking when and where we run analysis passes. So we pick an analysis schedule Right? by caching the results of lazy runs and memoizing them and just producing them later. Right? An analysis pass can't mutate the IR, so it doesn't really matter if some other pass runs in between when the analysis pass you wanted runs and when your analysis pass runs. There's no constraints to solve here. Right? It's totally fine to just take whatever topological order you have, right? you cache the results, you produce the cache results at each step when you need to, you ensure that the analyses only run once, and you've picked a perfectly good schedule. Super simple. Crazy questions? You wouldn't think I'm just like off in left field, okay. I have one. If you pass this and then you have a pass that changes. I'll repeat it. Oh, sorry. Thanks. So if you, if you pass the analysis pass and then you pass another pass that changes the IR, you can't use the cache again. So you have to repass again. Hang on to that question for like two slides. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what a caching-based analysis manager might look like for functions, okay? So we first have to have another one of these concepts and pass, you know, we have a, but we also have a result concept and a pass concept that are distinct. This just allows us to, to you know, actually talk about the idea of running a pass to get a result and then holding on to a result. The result actually has no interesting interface that we really care about. The idea is just to cache it somewhere, right? A void star would be enough, but there's a little bit of fun stuff in there. The interface for the analysis manager is very, very simple. You can get a result, right? If you're just getting a result, then maybe it will lazily run it if it doesn't have one. If it already has one, it will simply provide it. You can also do get cached result. This, this has the kind of obvious property of being const. It's never going to do anything. It's not gonna change anything. It's just gonna hand you whatever it happens to have. If it doesn't have anything, it's gonna hand you null, right? You also have the, the first sign of registration. You can register an analysis pass with an analysis manager. This makes a certain amount of sense because we want, we want to kind of know the total set of analyses that this manager is kind of dealing with in its life, right? And we also want to have the particular ability to set up an analysis pass with some initial state, you know, parameters, tunables, whatever they may be, and plug those into the manager so that whenever it gets queried, the query path doesn't have to know how to set up the analysis, right? The registration took care of that for it. And the final thing, and this should kind of start to give away the, the ghost here, is invalidate. 
Because naturally, the problem immediately becomes an invalidation problem, a cache invalidation problem, because this is computer science, right? And so we have to devolve to cache invalidation. So the question is, uh, you know, at what point, right, like if you, if you run a pass that transform the IR, you have to somehow go and invalidate all of the cached results, which are no longer usable. And that turns out to be where most of the complexity goes. Okay, so how do we do cache invalidation of analyses? Well, the first thing we needed to be able to talk about is kind of, you know, what, what are we even thinking about in, in terms of analyses? What, it, what are we trying to preserve? We need some way of actually naming a set of analyses that we care about preserving or not preserving. And so the new pass manager infrastructure provides you a pretty straightforward set class. It's got some convenient methods, right? This is the set of preserved analyses. You can get, you say you don't preserve any, you can say you preserve all, you can you know, um, mark a set as preserving something, right? You can query, um, I actually deleted one method in here that's kind of important. You can also intersect two sets. And that lets you figure out, okay, so now I can actually talk about the sets of analyses I care, I'm trying to preserve, or I need preserved, or any of the other qu queries we might have. We end up using this in all the, all the APIs. Make some sense? Okay. So now we have to start complicating our beautiful, beautiful, simple interfaces. Okay, the first thing to realize, uh, remember, a function pass manager is a pass. So the first thing to realize is that our pass interface has to get a little bit more complex. Now when we run a pass, it has to return something. It can't return void. The specific thing it needs to return is what set of analyses are preserved after that pass has run, right? That's, that's the first complication to the interface. The next, and you can kind of see how this is gonna play together, right? And the next thing we do is, is in the pass manager, we actually have to kind of accumulate these things and, and figure out how to model the preserved set of passes when, I, when I'm writing an aggregation. And it's not entirely surprising. What I do is I see what each of the sub-passes preserves, I intersect the sets, and the result of that is the set I preserve. Nothing crazy. Everyone's sort of happy with this? Yes. So, but then the, <clears throat> but then the, the trans, then, then the transforming passes have to know about the analysis passes in order to know which analyses to uh, discredit and which to leave alone. So, I mean, unless they query the analysis pass. Yeah. That. So absolutely. So, so the, the, you know, the question is like, doesn't this mean that all the transform passes have to know about all the analysis passes yeah. that they're going to preserve? Absolutely. And they already do today. There's always a conservative answer of, I don't preserve anything. I don't have to know what analysis passes there are to say, I preserve nothing. But if you know about the specific analyses, you can say that you preserve those specific analyses. And there are some cases where you can say, like, no, 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 I actually preserve every analysis. The reason I know I preserved every analysis is that I didn't change the IR. Got it. Right? And all of those are kind of modeled in that um, preserved analysis set. It gives you kind of special access to none and all without knowing what they're actually comprising. Yeah, so I, I get that you don't actually have to have knowledge of all the analyses if all you're doing is saying, well, I've I know I've preserved this analysis versus like I know I've in yeah. invalidated that one. Okay, got it. Yeah, this is why it's a preserved analysis, not an invalidated analysis. It makes it much easier to specify. <laughs> yes? I can repeat it. The question is, what happens across IR units? I promise I've got a slide for that. So does it make sense to have some passes that check the validity and verify that the analysis is verified? I don't see too many of these. Yeah, so, so the, the, this is a common desire. It'd be nice if we actually checked the, the things we say we preserve, we actually preserve. We actually do a little bit of this today, but very, very little. We're very bad about it, and it's one of the things I think we're going to have to get better at in order to adopt this new design, because it relies on it much more heavily. These are, these are from my experience, it's complicated bug I show, because people pretend it's preserving, but it's not. Yeah. I saw another hand at the back. Uh, 
I can't hear you. I'm happy to repeat it, but I can't hear you. Sorry. Thanks. This is Louise. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to get back to the beginning a little bit when you introduced the uh, past concept, I believe, and you mentioned that you also have result concept and all those things. Um, I just wanted to uh, get a clear picture of whether these are purely syntactical contexts or whether there is some semantical properties that these are also encapsulating. Um, there are semantics. This is, this is uh, at a core, this is just uh, concept-based polymorphism. Um, if you want to look it up, Sean Parent describes it in a bunch of talks. It's concept-based polymorphism. And there's a semantic contract. And, and I'm sorry, I, I've deleted all of the comments. These classes actually have nice comments uh, that actually kind of clarify a lot of this. But my slides are small. <laughs> OK, all right. Thank you. I just wanted to make clear of that. Absolutely. All right. So jumping back into this a little bit, we've got a function pass manager. The first thing we notice is that the idea of a pass has become more complicated. We're now pr recording what analyses are preserved. We're doing so conservatively, and we're returning that whenever we're run over a unit of IR. The next complication is that we have this analysis manager inside the pass manager and in the interface to the pass. Okay? And this is important because if the analysis manager that your pass is querying isn't visible to the pass manager that's running your pass, then we can't ensure that the invalidation steps actually occur at the right times. And, and we certainly can't ensure they occur at the optimal times. And so we always want a pass to kind of get its analysis manager from whatever pass manager is running it. Okay? And so we pass it down through the run method. Now, one thing that I, I couldn't find a good way to show on this slide is that this is actually optional. You don't have to accept an analysis manager in your pass interface. If you just only have one parameter to your run function, the pass manager knows how to do that, deal with that, and it just won't pass the, pass man the, the analysis manager to you. So you pay for what you use. If you don't need analyses, you don't pay for them. Right? If you do, you add the parameter, it will automatically be populated when your pass is run. Shouldn't you assume that if, if you don't know anything, you should validate everything? And, and the question is, uh, shouldn't you assume that if you don't know anything, right, then you should invalidate everything? And that's certainly true, but there may be cases where you happen to know, like, no, 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 I don't mutate the IR, I can't have invalidated things. So, so there is still a good use case for preserving all things. Okay. So, with an analysis manager, right, all, all the kind of interesting stuff that's going to happen here is that this pass manager is going to first pass that analysis manager down into each of the subordinate passes, right? And the second thing it's going to do is it's going to invalidate any analyses that each pass actually fails to preserve. And so the pass manager is taking care of all of the cache invalidation for you. And it's using this, this preserved analyses set to communicate from the pass which runs to the analysis manager what needs to be invalidated. Making some sense to folks? All right. So as we've been going through this, we've been talking about analysis managers, and they all operate over units of IR, just like the passes do. So the interesting thing is how do you actually model this when it crosses boundaries between IR? Um, and unlike normal passes, this is a much more complex operation, because this is bidirectional. All right, you can imagine a module pass querying function analyses. You can also imagine a function pass querying module analyses. So we need to support both directions of this. Um, the other thing that's a little bit tricky is that invalidation has to be propagated bidirectionally. Right? A function transformation can invalidate the entire module analysis. Right? And clearly, a module transformation invalidates every function analysis, potentially. Right? And it's even trickier. Right? How do we even identify the function for which the analysis was run if the transformation to the module removed that function? And so this is actually a really hard kind of cache invalidation problem where your keys may be invalidated at the same time as the values are invalidated. Okay, so this, this, is, this is where things started to get a little bit tricky. And you can tell because my slides get a bit harder to read. And I apologize, I worked really hard but it was, hard, it was very hard to make this fit. So bear with me. Also, the names just get silly. This is a function analysis manager module proxy. <laughs> OK, now we can debate whether this is a good name or a useful name all we want. I don't really care. 
the ultimate idea is that this is a module analysis pass, okay? And what it's doing as a module analysis pass is absolutely nothing. You can see it's run, and all it's run does is construct a result. All of the interesting logic here is in the result. And the result of this weird proxy analysis doesn't do anything either except provide two very important methods. Oh, jumped ahead of myself. The first method, the first method that's really super important here is that we can get the function analysis manager from this proxy. That's really, really important, okay? This proxy needs to be the path through which we always get that subordinate level of IR analysis manager because this proxy is responsible for ensuring invalidation occurs at the appropriate points, okay? And so this is the primary interface for kind of extracting a different level of IR's analysis manager. The second important thing is invalidation, okay? The nice thing is that the model of a module analysis being invalidated pretty cleanly maps onto, you know, fanning that invalidation out across all of the functions within that module, okay? And so we go and we look at what's going on and we actually kind of delegate this, this, this invalidation down. Now we do something really interesting here. We check whether this analysis is preserved and we only invalidate the function analyses if this mod proxy analysis fails to be preserved. The whole point of this is that if you have a module pass and you actually mark explicitly that you preserve this function analysis manager module proxy thing, right? You actually mark that you preserve this. What that says is, hey, no, I've taken care that all of the function analyses, all the function analyses that we have ever cached are correct after whatever I've done to the module. And there are times when this is actually pretty straightforward. For example, if you have a module pass which only manipulates globals, maybe it only deletes unreferenced globals, okay? You might be able to confidently say like, no, 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 no. None of the function analysis passes are completely invalidated. You might have to do some work. You might have to go query them, but you can actually say that, okay? And it's important that you have the ability to preserve function analyses when you know you didn't touch them. It also means that when the IR isn't changed and you, reserve, you return that, you know, I preserved everything, I know I preserved everything, it actually works in this delegation layer as well. Make some sense? Saw some concerned looks about that. Okay. Yes? The question is, is it only deletion, what about addition? Uh, well, the nice thing about addition is that if you added a function to an analysis, uh, to, to a module, um, it's pretty easy to tell that you, you don't have a cached analysis result for that function because it didn't exist before. If you add to the function manager? Uh, if, I mean, so if, you are, if, if your pass is actually directly manipulating the function analysis manager, and you say you preserved the function analysis manager, then you either have a bug or you did. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's within your hands. So how do we update the function pass manager to include that new function? Uh, the, there's a whole big interface on the function analysis manager. You can actually manually run analyses if you need to and inject results and do other things. So it's possible if you wanted to manually update it. And that's certainly a use case, right? A one use case for, for actually preserving analyses isn't that they're intrinsically preserved, but actually do work to ensure that they are correct after your transformation and then mark them as preserved. And that's one of the use cases we want to support. Okay, so this handles kind of the invalidation from you know, a higher order chunk of IR down to a lower order chunk of IR. So how do we handle the reverse? Turns out the reverse is easier, okay? Because in the reverse, you simply have fewer choices. There is no way to lazily run a, a module analysis pass and produce a useful cache entry from within a function transformation. Because if you are within a function transformation pass, you're not allowed to go and look at other functions, right? You're not allowed to, to, to do anything with them. You can't touch them. So unless you already have some analysis cached and ready, you just, you can't touch it, okay? And so we have this 
lovely thing, which just provides uh, access to the module analysis manager, but it's a const access, so it says that you can't create new cache entries. You can only query what's already in the cache. Um, and it also doesn't do anything to handle invalidation because the actual pass managers themselves propagate invalidation back up the stack, right? If you remember what our function pass manager looked like, it actually returned the intersected set of preserved passes up to whatever is managing it, and that takes care of the invalidation for you. So this, is, this turns out to be the simpler of the two problems. Um, whether or not it's actually invalidated. Uh, it just prevents us from rerunning a trivial pa analysis pass that's just going to reconstruct a result. That's all. Uh, running a little short on time, so I'm going to skip ahead. You guys had good questions. Uh, so the, the first thing I want to briefly mention is that we still need to understand how we actually funnel these analysis managers back and forth between the layers of IR. And this happens inside of the adapter between the two layers of IR. So this is the less simplified version of the adapter. Okay? When the adapter actually receives uh, an analysis manager in its argument, it has to get the next level of analysis manager out of it. Right? And then it has to pass it down, and it has to invalidate it as the thing is running. Right? This isn't too, too surprising. It's just responsible for actually doing that step of delegation. So I was going to try and go through and actually show you guys how to use them, but all of this code is checked in. And I've only got a few minutes, so I want to skip ahead. Um, I want to talk, talk about a few loose ends that I haven't really covered yet. Um, automatic registration. Uh, lots of people talk about automatic registration. It's, really, it's a really fundamental part of our existing stuff. And my answer is simply no. Uh, this causes endless problems for us, right? Like, uh, if you want to understand how frustrating automatic registration of passes is, talk to either Owen or Chris Bienemann. Like, they will tell you about the pain and suffering they have gone through trying to support this use case. Um, I don't actually think the use case is really that important. I would like passes to stop being special. I would like them to just be like any other piece of code. Right? We know how to you know, or like orchestrate your APIs so that you can you know, construct an object with the various pieces of input you need and then pass it around to another object. We know how to like, you know, you know, collect things together into containers and these types of things. These are simpler concepts. We don't need an automatic magical registry hiding behind the scenes. Um, when it comes to things like uh, command line stuff, we, we need to throw out the entire command line parsing anyways. Because the existing command line parsing magically infers structure from this like, flat sequence of arguments that doesn't actually have structure. And so there are these like, even more magical arguments which kind of slightly change how that structure is inferred because they're special barrier passes. Like, it's, it's a terrible pile of hacks. Instead, we could define a super simple textual syntax for specifying a pass pipeline, including structure. And then we could parse that. And we could actually put that code in a library, and that library could be registered with the names of all the passes, and then all the front ends that ever want to you know, use textual ways of registering passes could use that library, and there's no more need for registering command line flags for passes just to get their you know, pass name in there. So that kind of just obviates all of these things. And we still need to solve something for plugins, but it's, it seems much more straightforward to give plugins a dedicated access to registering their particular name of pass, rather than trying to tie it to global variables with weird initializers. It's really scary to me. The, the other loose end, or one of the other loose ends I, I kind of feel like I need to talk about is reusing passes. So one thing you might notice is that you actually pass these things around by value. Okay, and so, so the expectation is you're actually going to move them most of the time into the pass managers, which means the pass managers are going to take ownership of the things. And a lot of people are worried about, like, well, but what if that's going to increase the compilation cost? The idea here is just factor that out of the pass. If you need to have a pass context that maintains long-lived data structures, have that. Have it outside of your pass. Pass it into the constructor of the pass, right, and, and like reference it lazily. There are lots of ways to actually manage data structures externally to the pass infrastructure, and this keeps writing passes very, very simple, which is what the majority of passes want. So, super quickly, where do things stand? Um, most of the infrastructure is in tree. So almost all of the code I've shown you today has been cribbed and like massaged to fit onto a slide out of like checked-in code. All right, I'm not showing you like any future things. So if you want to play with it, go play with it, check it out. I encourage you to try it out. Um, 
There's also a bunch of uh, support for other things I didn't talk about, like SCCs. Um, there's not support for loops yet. Um, I'm not planning on doing basic blocks or instructions because they don't really seem relevant. Um, I have a whole section on like what's next, but we're out of time, and so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and stop it. I'm sorry, I, I made a terrible mistake of like adding things because I was worried I didn't have enough material. SCC tests to have uh, uh, to gather functional analysis information. So the question is, how will these work with SCC passes to query function analysis passes? Uh, the same way, like, so I used a module because the module is a lot easier to talk about. But there's there's an, a, there's kind of a proxy that lets the module query the function analysis manager, and get results for function analysis function analyses. You can set up. Uh, a totally analogous proxy for the function analysis manager to a SEC pass manager, right? One of the things is that it, it's, it's really decoupled how many layers of IR we have. So one particularly obnoxious thing today about the way things are is we actually have multiple pass managers, for, not just for like different levels of IR passes, but also for the machine passes and all that. Do you have thoughts on how to clean that up and maybe unify it in some sane way and get rid of all those static initializers and all that random stuff that you know I care about? I have thoughts, but I don't actually trust them. Um, I haven't spent enough time looking at it to really understand the problem and to have any confidence in the answers. I hate to punt, but. About his question earlier about the verification to see if it actually invalidates or not. Uh, it could be as complex as running the whole pass again. So this could be something like a search that you just turn on when running the test or validation, whatever, but you turn off in production. That's, that's uh, what I would like to see. So, so you can actually look at some of the existing pass, analysis passes, and they have a way to kind of compare them and to, to, to validate the results. And we just need to actually you know, do that more consistently as an engineering thing. And then once it's kind of consistently available, add support to the analysis layers to kind of speculatively rerun analyses, even though they're cached in debug builds or in special builds, and validate, like, no, 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 we actually we got the same thing again. Um, it's going to be a little bit tricky because it'll actually become exponential cost if you're not careful. But like, we know how to solve these problems. So, like, this isn't scary. I would like to go back to the uh, flow, so the pass manager flow. So basically, we are supporting like iterative compilation, and it's really hard to see. So it's really hard to know to know what's the flow of the compiler. So what are the, how the ordering is. So can we have a way or to expose the loop so that people know when they look at the file, they know that something's going on here. So, so, so the, real stuff is happening. So the, the, the best hope there is actually kind of logging. Um, and if you actually look at the test cases that are checked in for this infrastructure, there's, there's a pass debugging mode. And what it does is it actually prints every step of what it does as it does it. And that's actually how a bunch of the tests are structured. They're, they're not, they're not looking at the IR. They're making sure that we actually like, you know, we do this and then we do this and then we do this and then we do this, and that, and that the sequence is a reasonable sequence. Um, I don't know of a better solution to that, especially because uh, one of the things I want to do next is to paralyze the optimizer, which makes it really hard to know what's happening next. <laughs> And silence reigns. So, uh, right here. Uh, so, so what you've um, presented is a new mechanism for uh, managing the passes. What I'm confused about is how you handling the transition from the old. Do do you support both in the code base, or how does that work? So, the first next thing is that we have to port the existing pipelines and all the passes. And while the port's going on, we absolutely are going to support both. There's just there's just no other way. And it turns, I've, having started on this a little bit, it's not bad. Uh, you end up just being able, you just factor the code out so that the code's shared between both pieces of like, you know, glue. And eventually we'll fold that away. But it, it actually ends up cleaning up most of the analysis passes when you do it. So it's, it's, it, the, the loss isn't very, isn't very high there. OK, and, and then to promote the new style, have you 
update the tutorials so that people who are adding new code use it the new way? Uh, I don't want people to add the new to, to use the new way when they're adding new code because it's not actually enabled yet. Um, right now, it's on me to keep up with new code coming in uh, during the port. Once we start talking about enabling it, that's when that's when we want to make sure people uh, take over. But this is kind of the first step of documenting how things were probably going to look. Other mic? Can we get the other mic? Okay. The past manager. Um, is, in is updating the state of the analysis manager during the passes that it's running, but it's returning the intersection of all the passes, all the analyses that are invalid. Isn't that overly conservative? Because an earlier pass that it's run may invalidate, say, the def use change, and a later pass may recreate them but not destroy them. Yeah, we should fix that. Hey, it's conservatively correct. Yes. But I agree. So we ran out of time. The question is, does this help out the static pipeline? Is that what you said? Okay, so, so the question is, right now, you know, if you have a fixed number of passes and, and nothing's varying, uh, it's, it's, it's hard because you have to have global constructors all the same and all kinds of dependency stuff. Um, I think it gets simpler, right? Because now like, you just have, like, have global variables of those types if you want. It's not going to matter because they're not, like, you lose ownership, right? You're going to have a pass manager to do the aggregation. But it's, it's, pass managers are now as heavyweight as a vector of pointers with a virtual call to actually run something on that pointer, on the, on the object that pointer is referencing, right? Like, I can't, I can't imagine how to make something lower overhead than that. Guys, we run enough time. Thank you very much. <laughs>